Hi, welcome to another conversation, uh, Miami Corona Project conversation. And I'm so honored uh, to have an icon of the eco art world, an icon of the art world, uh, someone who 40 years ago stepped outside of her traditional art training and carved a unique path to work with the environment, communities, science, and art. She began looking to her inner consciousness as a source of inspiration, which well, initiated her public engagement, starting with gritty art performances on the New York City streets. She was engaging in women's movement of the 1970s, where she found No Limits for Women Artists, a network to join and support female artists. Since her founding of Keepers of the Water in 1991, Betsy has continued to work towards creating community-based models of water stewardship. Her work includes sculpture, teaching, lectures, and workshops. In China, she created the nation's first public living art event for the environment, and most notably, the Living Water Garden, a world-renowned public park and natural water filtration model. In the US, she continues working with communities and grassroots groups, as well as completing art and design commissions. It's such an honor to have you here, uh, Betsy. It's been a while since uh, uh, we hosted you at our home in Miami. I remember you wanted to come and help trim our garden for us because it was so lush. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, I'm recalling that. It's so honored to be with you. And yeah. I just, I have all kinds of like just personal questions, but <laughs> yeah. no, really thank you for asking me. No, no, look, I, I just thought it was really, really important to, to connect with someone like you who's been a thought leader and a movement maker, right? Since, uh, God, <laughs> for, for decades now. And God, some things sort of repeat themselves. I want to talk about the pandemic, but I can't. I, I think we need to begun, begin by talking about the pandemic and uh, what's happening across our nation today um, as uh, protests uh, continue to happen. And, well, let's just talk. Let's just talk about <laughs> where, where we are, right? Because we're trying yeah. to, to engage audiences and trying to effectuate change and we see the interconnectedness of things and we'll talk of course about how the pandemic is connected to climate to the environment to water much as the very issues at hand where marginalized individuals continue to be oppressed and i, I just wanted to open it up for you and just let's just have a conversation a little bit about that <laughs> yeah well what really you know strikes me is that you know, the communities that um, were really aware of climate change were those transition communities on the fringes, in the marshlands, um, trying to, you know, who'd sort of been pushed out of anywhere to live except uh, where, um, where they could. And just like in Laramie and Pittsburgh, the most conscious community was the poor black community. And uh, so, then you, we have this pandemic, which is disproportionately affecting people of color in this country for all kinds of reasons. And then the indigenous population, they don't even have hospitals. They just, uh, they don't have anything. And, uh, I raised some money to send out to one place, but you know, we should be raising thousands. I mean, ten thousand dollars should be going out to reservations. And if there's any way that people who hear me now go on my website, <laughs> yeah, give, give us. I mean, your bio um, and of course your website and all your contact information will be below this video. Uh, but go ahead and just tell them where to go. Just yeah. go on to Keepers of the Waters and donate. Yeah, dot org, um, right? Keepers of the yeah. Water dot, dot org. Yeah, and donate. And the money goes straight there. And I found an organization that works directly on the ground providing food and medical supplies, but also providing uh, the equipment and what they need to start raising their own food more. So but we have to look towards like how to build real sustainability into our lives and, and into the lives of every single human being. And we've become, I feel like, I don't know how I say how to say it, like a whole lot of people have become totally numb, like. I want my cappuccino in a spur of the moment. I'm, I can get my fresh vegetables, you know, in a spur of the moment. But that's a very small part of our population, actually. And um, uh, so there's just so, there's so much to talk about. <laughs> yeah, so let's try to break it down into little pieces. Maybe, maybe, we, maybe we do start with the pandemic. Let's just talk about 
um, you in New York, and then let's let's expand. Um, you know, from there, how interconnected we are, how populations all over the planet, ecosystems that are collapsing, um, globalization, yep. supply chains, all the all these things came together to create this perfect storm that par paralyzed us. But many, as we all know, uh, didn't have the choice to um, to have social distancing because they needed to work. And we're talking about essential workers, but not just those in hospitals, but people who are essential, not just to us, but to their families, people who are essential to the livelihood of their households. They are essential workers to that household and that community. And they had to take public transport and still do to this day. And they couldn't afford masks and they surely couldn't call to have the food delivered to their homes. Those, those systems and those structures that you saw fall apart in a pandemic, clearly where we have contagious diseases, explains to us as clear as day how interconnected and interrelated they are and how no one is disposable. It's something that we do. I question sometimes the meat packers who are forced to work, right? To, well, to we, we don't put people first. That's right. what the pandemic has totally taught me. We're one of the most, we're one of the richest countries in the world. We're one of the least populated. We're one of the most environmentally uh, resourced countries that, you know, when you look at China, India, all kinds of other places. Um, and we could not put people first. We could not, we could not, we have systematically taken apart whatever social networks we had and they weren't strong enough anyway. And those social networks did not include a high percentage of the population, period. So why, why are we one of the few countries that doesn't have Medicare for medical you know, insurance for everybody? What, what is that about? And so all of this comes into play in my mind. Sure. Um, it's, hard, it's a heartbreaking situation. Like I love my country. <laughs> Oh, we do. Yeah. I love my country. And, you know, I came back from 10 years in China. I went through SARS in Beijing. Boy, did they know how to shut down. Boom. And everybody protects everybody. So regardless of what you read bad news in our papers, because that's what they have to report. You know, the general collaboration, cooperation of the population is huge. And um, it's... Uh, so we always like to report, you know, <laughs> stuff. So, so as an artist, you, you, I think, use the power, the elasticity, the, the um, convening force that art is, I think, to effectuate change, whether it was trying to break into the, um, into the, in, to re redefine right? the art world for women artists, whether it was to try to uh, look at, look at, Look at the environment. Look at um, a way, a new way of seeing. Right. So, what what lessons can we teach current artists? Uh, what lessons have we learned that current artists can use today? Whether it is in uh, the mid in in front of a of a police line in Lafayette Park, or if it is at uh, an emergency room in New York City. What 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 role do artists have? as we uh, face not just this pandemic in this moment, but the moments to come, because of course, climate change uh, is roaring uh, because we keep on putting more and more carbon, more than we did during the Paris talks. And we are really um, in peril as a nation. Well, well that, yeah. yeah, I think, I mean. Uh, as a world, not as a nation, as a, yeah. as a species, as every, right? Like, uh, we, artists I know all over the world are exposing, articulating, educating, creating, uh, and, uh, you know, sometimes I feel, oh, wow, we are, you know, tremendously effective, and sometimes I feel like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, and the truth of it all is, is that we have reduced the living system so much that vi this isn't going to be the last virus. This exactly. one's mild compared to the next one. Because viruses seek hosts. And when they don't have enough host, they leap into 
us or animals and other things. So we have to vigorously restore our living systems. And it can't be any longer that I'll take your Everglades, where the sugar plantations or the plantation owners dominate what happens in the Everglades. It can't be that way. If Florida's going to survive, the Everglades have to come. I mean, the flow throughs, the dynamics of it have to begin to be restored, not in 10 years, not in 20 years, but next year. Yep. And we've reduced the forest cover on the planet from it was 70% down to 30%. We can hardly breathe because trees were our forefathers. They were here before us. They are the reason that human beings could be on this earth. And they are the reason, what are we going to do? Manufacture huge oxygen things, you know, like, right. <laughs> what are, what, come on, wake up, you know, trees, 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 you know. And so when the governor of Oregon ordered all tree lumber things to stop, the Republicans walked out of the legislature so they would not have to vote for it. So whatever, I don't, I don't, I, we can no longer take political stands. We all have to take a stand for the earth. Mm -hmm. We have to. And the virus has given us a pause. The dolphins came back in the waters around Venice. Venice was one of the deadest places I ever went. I felt so sad about it. I mean, so sad. And you can hear, you could hear uh, nature, at least here in New York City for a period of time. And but, but we, I feel, uh, no, I fear, <laughs> I really, really fear, are going to find our old, back to our old ways, you know. I, we I, can't. I, we can't. Know, I, I, but how do we, I mean, but that's what's happening, right? Like, I mean, there's an election coming, but that's where we are headed. Like we, we have, um, over the last 800, um, thousand years, the carbon has gone between 200 to 300 million parts per million for 800,000 years. There's an, there's an entire record mm -hmm. of that, that, and that usually happened through a long period of time tens right. of thousands of years, right? The change from 200 yeah. to 300, right? Yeah. We, in the last 160 years, have gone up by 100, but it wasn't from 200 to 300. We've gone to where we've never, ever, ever, ever been before as a society. We are now. We went from 300 to 400, not over 10,000 years, but in the span of 160 years, because we put carbon, and that is indisputable. It is indisputable, yeah. it's indisputable. But... But we, our nation, through our elected officials, continue, continue to fund, to subsidize, to prop up the fossil fuel industry instead of looking at this moment and saying, oh, more heat, more ecosystem collapse. That means the tropics come north, which means the vectors of disease come north. Oh, and more deforestation, which means more wild animals come contact, into contact with humans and have their transmission. And at this moment, when we have a climate emergency, where we have no time left, because it takes 4,000 years for carbon's half-life, right? So the carbon is there. Our planet's temperature is going to go up. We are at the precipice of catastrophe, and we are still electing people into office. I guess we're going to have to take Black Lives Matter as a model. Okay. And that's how I think they're, I think, I, I see that connection. I see the connection at so many levels. And I think this pandemic and this movement are a precursor of what's coming as, as society. But go ahead, Betsy. Well, you know, Extinction Rebellion in yep. England. Sure. It, you know, um, what's her name? Jane Fonda is leading Extinction Rebellion around the country in places. So. I mean, <laughs> but my question is this is, is, is so, you know, there's I mean, and I'm being so simplistic right now, but there's, you know, there's a third who don't believe. I mean, there's a third who still believe that um, uh, the, uh, the person in the White House uh, is doing a good job, uh, even with the protests. Right. So there's a third that finds like an impossible waste of energy to try to really change those minds at this moment. They, they will come. They will come when their children are in ICUs. They will come, right? But today, in face of a pandemic, wearing a mask is still a political choice as opposed to a clinical medical choice. Well, that's so we, very stupid. Yeah. <laughs> not stupid. It's just stupid, right? But it's my stupid. point is, if you want to change policy, I'm not sure that that's the one third to focus on. 
No, no, don't focus on them. Right. Don't that, focus right. on them, okay? Right. At all. So there's the other third, and I'm being so simplistic, I'm sorry. There's the other third that are with us. They literally, you know, marching and they're doing everything and they're voting and they're funding and they're doing it all. But we still have a system between gerrymandering and the very way that our Senate is created, structured, that doesn't allow the majority of Americans to have their wishes, whether it's gun control or health care or environmental issues. We are still as a well, nation. It has to change, okay? If that's all. I, I don't know why. I just can't, you know, at 80, this is the last thing I want to do. I would like to have lead a quiet life right. and I want to write books and I have paintings I want to do. And yes, I would love to help every community take charge of their water quality. Um, I will go out as a strong advocate against water bottling and the return of right. a public water supply. Fountains, water fountains was a deliberate removal staged thing by Nestle's in Detroit to start the campaign for bottled water. Um, so there are certain campaigns that I will continue, which I think we could do, you know, like I actually think we could do some, we could do this. Sure. Right? So um, uh, yeah, it's going to be very painful. People are going to die. They're going to lose their children. Um, it's go it's going to be amazingly painful. And yeah, yeah. Uh, we're having uh, some issues here in South Water with our beloved Everglades, right? I mean, the sea level rise is oh, yeah. increasing the salinity of our aquifer. Yep. That's how our people drink. That's how our plants, you know, that taproot of these <laughs> trees outside of my house go into that aquifer. That aquifer is getting salinated. These trees are not salt tolerant. You know, we, we are in, we are in, it, 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 you know, what I call the precipice of catastrophe. And I just <laughs> yeah. want to know how we tap, how we, how we tap into not the either third, because those are mobilized in their own direction. How do we use the power of art to make that middle third see differently, to reframe priorities, to have them understand what's really important so that their behavior in life, but more importantly, in the ballot box is consistent <laughs> with their values? What can art do? What can art do to help? What can this new generation of artists do to help take us there? What, like if, if, if you were literally not talking uh, to a 55 year old, but you were talking to a 25 year old who's just starting I'd ask them what career. You, I would ask them, what do you really care about? What do you care about most? And where are you, uh, where are you discouraged? Or what have you given up on? And okay, so let's go back to what this other thing, what could you start that you would love to start, which you think might be useless? I would ask some questions like that. I've taught that way and the students go out there and do things, you know, the San Antonio River cleanup was started by a student, saving the Edwards Aquifer, it's still not safe, even though it's a state park. But it, there's initiative in everyone and it's kind of been rubbed out in the educational system and in our social structures. It's been rubbed out, like, no, you can't do that. Kind of like, um, you know, only thing I was expected to do was marry a good guy, a rich guy. Yeah. That was the only thing I was expected to do. So, you know, uh, and, you know, the system, it, it particularly scares, I think, middle class people uh, because you'll lose your middle classedness or, you know, you want your kid to have make a good income and everything. So there's a pullback from, from uh, that. But also, Try and organize neighborhood by neighborhood. Neighborhood by neighborhood. That's where all our salvations are, is in helping each other. And as artists, you can do it all kinds of ways. Like we posted, my daughter and I both posted some things about, um, about racism and then other people started adding. So we sort of have this little street <laughs> wall that's, you know, People are adding their creativity. I just looked at a huge wall that's been created in Brooklyn for Black Lives Matter. Just gorgeous paintings and portraits of people. It's ginormous. So creativity is infinite. Everyone has it. It's not just us artists. What we, We've just mm -hmm. chosen to have a skill, right? Take that skill and no matter what you think, you know, uh, Put something public, talk to your neighbors. I know a lot of artists who are doing this. I know when I was in Lhasa, I just sat in the grass behind the patella and started doing something. And all these people came to join me. 
I mean, and that would happen here too. Uh, and we there's a lot of awful lot of misinformation out there. So, you know, that just in my field, like that water quality doesn't really matter. We can make fake water, we can clean up your water. So the agenda of the superstructure is to take all the water and sell it back to you expensively. Hmm. Now that's such a class, that's, a, that's to me, that's a form of genocide, just like water bottling is a form of genocide. Talk about the truth. People, people talk about the truth, but without an edgy anger. <laughs> now there's used to anger, but edgy anger, desperation doesn't really work. So talk about the truth and how much fun it is to live with truth. You know, it's really fun. It's easy on our hearts, even if it's hard work physically. Because, you know, nobody likes not being able to care about everything and everybody. But we've been taught you can't do that. You can't care about everybody and everything. But actually, it's a heartbreaker for us not to do that. I went in the Everglades and I felt so sick because it's down to less than 10% of its living capacity. And um, that was when I was in Florida. I'm sure it hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. You know, and I suggested that they replant the palm, those palm apple thing, trees, and they said, oh, that's too hard. Well, they were all cut down because the indigenous people used them as protection and could live there. So they cut them all down so the indigenous people could hide out in the Everglades anymore. So there's a lot of things that have gone the wrong direction. Betsy, it's so um, inspiring but difficult. Uh, so help me. <laughs> it's so inspiring but difficult uh, to not be angry. You just saw me get a little passionate here about 400 parts per million, right? Like I'm, yeah. I, I am, I am livid. I, I just right. And I get frustrated, you know, but, yeah. but tell, give me, give me, give me, give us some examples of how to not do edgy anger, just so that, well, I, I agree with you, by the way, yeah. I do agree with well, you. Well, you know, right now the edgy anger out there is working, you know, but like as Maya Angelou said, use your anger. But then I think there's sort of like the anger where, you know, you really, you know, like I'm standing in front of you and you can feel, I want to kill you. Now that probably won't work for long sure. periods of time. Yep. I, at least I personally never found it could work. I agree but, with you. I agree you with know, you. Um, but my anger would be, I want you to be alive. I want your children to be alive. And I'm enraged that we are poisoning all your food and taking away the possibility of having a life that's not hidden indoors with asthma and artificial cooling machines and using up the leftover energy that's here. I mean, if it means we all have to decide to walk, let's all walk. You know, what's, what's, what could we, I mean, maybe you and I could, <laughs> okay. <laughs> we could get, you know, a, a thousand artists and like Planet Walker who just decided never to ride on anything and, um, and, and to walk, you know, so he walked everywhere and ends up being in the Pentagon um so can we you know what is it that we decide to do so many people during this at least in around me are learning to garden for the first time right. we're sure. curious about food okay so how much food could we produce like i was thinking of making a map say because all these buildings are empty because everyone's staying home so what if all those buildings that were once workspaces were taken away and became a forest in manhattan manhattan would survive then but the way it's going, it's not going to survive. There's no way. Uh, people hate to hear that. You know, they've infilled everything where they should have opened things so the water can come in and out. And, uh, you know, because what, what, no matter how high you build the wall, the water will always go over it. Right. You know, and the Dutch know that. And we had the Dutch come here and we didn't follow what they said. So there's so many solutions and creative things that can happen and we can talk about them but we can even maybe model them on whatever scales possible i always I would love i love somebody said I, I would love to work on a large scale like yeah. <laughs> you know <laughs> i mean i have this idea for cleaning up the mississippi so you know groups give people a little bit of money to do a cleanup midway of the mississippi the towns in the center you can't clean a river except from the top 
what are we doing? What are, what are we thinking? It's all wrong, you know? Um, there are, what, 15,000 open uranium mines up in the Northwest and West that spew toxic half-life radioactive stuff into the water and the earth. We can clean that up. I've had several very famous scientists who have told me they would do it if I can find the right situation. So there's so much we can do in the minute you had something in a right direction. It's a kind of like this. You know? <laughs> no, I see that. And I think in many ways, if you just take it down to what's happening at this moment, uh, yeah. I, um, I mean, I've, I've felt this before. Uh, <laughs> I'm not being duped, but I do think the change is coming. Um, you know, Watch I, out. I, I, know, I know, I know, I'm about to get hit. Uh, yeah. But I, I do hope um, that change is coming. I do, I do, I do think that that um, that this is a different time, a different moment. And I think that um, the students that I that I teach, the the this new generation that is so inspiring, I think is going to get it right. And I just want- They know people, they have to. <laughs> they have no choice, right? And I just want whatever tools you and I, you know, sort of learned along the way, I just want to be able to say, look, in this context, in that time, under those conditions, this is how we did it. Now you take your new tools in another time, in another context, and see if you can sharpen or do something we did with those tools. So if you could just, as a way of closing this conversation, you know, again, okay. there in your in your apartment, you had a you had, you know, um, one of these very motivated, inspired, um, thoughtful protesters who are peacefully asking for nothing more than equal access to justice. That's all they're asking: equal justice. Not a big. It was a huge ask, but it shouldn't even have to be an ask. It's actually guaranteed by our constitution, right? Yeah. But yeah. they're sitting in front of you now. Could you just give them a story about? what you did maybe uh the work you did in china maybe whatever what you did give some moment of how it is that you brought community together to solve a problem using your creativity like what give them an example of how you did it so that they could learn from that and apply it to this moment i never thought of defeat I didn't, I don't, I, I, I still don't quite understand since they were not supposed to work with foreigners, no public art was allowed. Uh, and um, I, I think that if someone was sitting here and they've been out on the streets and they've been doing this for 20 years, right? Uh, I don't think that uh, Maya Angelou or Carmichael or all these different people have considered defeat. And I think we can't consider it. It's a waste of our time. It's a waste of your good energy because it takes energy to fall into being disappointed, defeated, despaired, anything else like that. And, you know, as somebody very wise said to me who went through the revolution in China, she said, revolution is very hard. And, um, but right now, I do think we're in a pause to pivot and join forces with everyone, even if what you do is sit on your stoop in your street and you have a conversation about what you love about being alive. Because the gut of life is being destroyed. What do you love about hearing those birds? You know, what do you really, really love? And it sounds almost naive, but it's um, simple, but it's not, it's really not simple to, um, to lead really from that op the, uh, option that there is no other way, but with our hearts, there is no defeat. And, um, you know, I've watched a, elderly, incredible black woman, woman build a, a peace park, uh, give her land. Now, there's all kinds of foundations. They give money, right, to everything. They didn't give her money. Now they give her $5,000 or something. Just give her the $40,000 she needs to make that glorious and easily. Because she has 
scraped everything together she possibly can. And, and it's a celebration for a lot of people. And, um, you know, that's when I really got to understand how foundations control the economic imperative. And they may say they put people first, but they don't. <laughs> At least not Carnegie or Heinz or the ones I was, or even, um, you know, uh, public art America. It's just a kind of, so we have to wise up, not be duped. <laughs> don't be fooled. <laughs> and uh, the truth is, the truth has to, the truth ultimately has to win. That, that, that's what's happening right now is that all the untruths are being, you know, pulled back. We can see them. I mean, I didn't, never thought of our healthcare system as that terrible. And if you go on UN statistics, the United States is very low. It's low on funding for the arts. It's low on child survival and mortality. We're much lower than you know, 30 other nations on all kinds of things. So let's wake up and make, uh, the only thing we're here in charge of is ourselves. And then our immediate relationships, but, you know, wake up, team up. <laughs> Don't let despair take over. Don't. I love, I love um, your words. I mean, they're so, much that um i will replay and replay and replay betsy because they're they're inspiring i mean I don't consider defeat is, <laughs> is i think the mantra here because the only option. Option. come on xavier if you and i have to walk and meet in uh, georgia or something or or i have to come down there you know, you know. Yeah, no. look look i'm i'm a, yeah. i'm, I'm a, yeah. I'm really uh, happy with what we're doing, and you know, when when we hang up with our our video call, we'll, we'll talk, and I'll catch you up on everything yeah. I'm I'm doing with. Um, How are mangroves coming? We're doing we're doing well. If you yeah, hey, I, yeah. I guess we can let Come them on, yeah. It's yeah. good. I am um I am actually the mangroves aren't doing as good as I need them to do. So remember those mangroves that you saw me planting? I don't, oh, yeah. When were you in Miami? I don't even remember what what year was that. That was over right. a decade ago. Yeah. I'm trying to remember when it was, but it was a long time ago. Oh, wait, so, yeah. So those mangroves that we um, that I uh, planted with all those volunteers on the barrier islands will not be able to um, um, outcompete the rising seas. In mm -hmm. time, you know, the those barrier islands will be underwater, mm -hmm. and um, I um are continue planting them we literally continue the reclamation project but we had a new iteration this year to address sea level rise and saltwater intrusion so now we are planting the mangrove betsy in people's yards all across miami dade county they they can survive on fresh water they've mm -hmm. just adapted to salt water mm -hmm. and we do that as a way of marking um the change that is coming in time the trees in your yard but for that mangrove will not survive because of saltwater intrusion. They're, mm -hmm. they're, the, the sprinkler that you have takes water from the well, which is the aquifer, which will be salinated. Um, and importantly, I think it gives you um, a conspicuous reminder every day that as that tree grows, that little sapling, oh, I had one here, I moved mm -hmm. it. As that little sapling grows and becomes a tree, you're more and more vulnerable because it's the passage of time and as time mm -hmm. passes, the oceans rise. So it's just a way of engaging community and we give them a flag, a white flag where we mark the elevation of their property and they put it next to the mangrove in their yard so that we can begin to map the topography of Miami-Dade County, how many feet of sea level need to rise before your home is flooded. But more importantly, uh, way before that happens, the taproot of these mangroves are are drinking salinated water so mm -hmm. that that that's just a conceptual way a participatory way an engaged way of um understanding yes that i will not accept defeat i will begin today you know uh mm -hmm. to plant mangroves and i still do plant mangroves <laughs> on the coastal areas even though i know that in time that's going to give way to to uh 
you know, the ecosystems are literally migrating, right? So there's regime changes. So the mangroves will give way to the seagrasses. The coral reefs will all be gone. Um, there's clear, clear ecosystem collapse. And yes, sugar, agriculture continues polluting our water and there is no teeth to the regulations. The regulations- I know, I learned that. There's no teeth. teeth. And and there's, the, yeah, so, so the richest people support the whole system. So there, it's, it's a problem, but once we start connecting ecosystem collapse with economic collapse, not just mm -hmm. for what is obvious, which is yes, uh, you know, the, the dishwasher in the hotel won't have a job because there won't be tourists at the hotel because the tourists don't want to sit in green pea soup for their vacation. So not just ecosystem collapse at that level, but then real estate collapse because yeah. now your property. So I try to, through my work, to, to make connections like that by using art, using a, a weird, strange thing <laughs> like a mangrove tree in your front yard with a white flag and an elevation as a way of engaging people in those conversations. And, and with the help of these millennials, these students that I'm talking to you about, um, there's been a, a lot of progress and a lot of movement in that area. We had these, I still use the installations um, on Windows. So we had one in every single one of our 50 public libraries this past year. And we had a bunch of schools participating where they had their installations. And just, uh, we have a farmer's market that prior to the pandemic, we would literally engage people in conversations and use an app to figure out their elevation. So that whole community engaged process of having them see differently as something that in a very hopeful way <laughs> in a non-angry way so i'm with you i guess yeah, I, so I, 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 mean, I do these things that's all i've ever done but uh you're so good at that <laughs> but i'm getting angry i really i really yeah. am just i'm really i'm really like getting i want to see you angry too <laughs> oh no no I, <laughs> I get angry i really do yeah i mean but remember i'm always trying to get so i never focus on the other third yeah. so that's why you don't see me explode so <laughs> i'm always i'm always focusing on the middle third i don't focus too much on the believers and i don't focus too much on um with the believers i'm just like <laughs> well i do i do focus i mean i do focus i mean because they're they're the they're the they're the the force that have, you know they're they're important but i channel them to yeah. find ways to um to change minds in the middle. And it's it's just, you know, it's it's a difficult, difficult thing to do. So what I've begun to do in my practice is try to really spread it out. So I've yeah. hired a director of something called Cortada Projects. And then uh, that director works with teams of mm -hmm. sometimes interns, volunteers. So I'm really trying to institutionalize the practice. Mm -hmm. Well, institutionalize sounds really strong. I'm trying to organize the practice in a way where uh, I don't have to be in it. And that's, that's become very, very successful. And I also learned along the way that I, I needed to um, keep it um, within, uh, within uh, sort of my sphere so that it would not um, become anything other than this engaged, this socially engaged art practice, because you always have to work with hosts, but unless you had mm -hmm. keepers of the water that you controlled and you uh, nurtured, then other interests would, you know, sort of follow the grant or have the tail wag the dog. So in my practice, what I've learned after all these years is, okay, I have to build a home where others can come and from that place organize themselves to to do that work. And it's been really successful. I, I started an underwater homeowners association here in my <laughs> county. You, know, you are so good at this. I mean, I totally admire this. Uh, <laughs> so none of that is angry. So I'm, I'm with you. You know, yeah. I just uh, I feel it. But my actions are about convening and engaging and making it work. And I just thought with this with this pandemic, the reason I'm doing these conversations is because I remember being in, in Africa during um, the uh, International AIDS Conference there in 2000. I had been in the uh, one the year two years prior. The uh, you know they happen every two years in Geneva, mm -hmm. and that one. Um, um, was about bridging the gap between, you know, this global South and back there in 1998, um, uh, about HIV drugs not being accessible to all, right? That was a serious issue then, speaking of pandemics. And as I was there in Durban, South Africa, 
uh, in the next conference, which was um, uh, held, I, I remember looking at all these waves crashing on the shores of Durban, South Africa. And all I could think about was not the beauty of these waves, but just the wave of deaths that that continent was facing again because of lack of access and because there were some really stupid demagogues saying that, uh, you know, at attaching religious and morality and stupidity to the whole conversation. So I, I created a mural which hangs at their museum, the Durban Art Gallery. Well, it doesn't hang, it's probably in the, the back room somewhere. But I, one of my collaborative pieces where I just had people from all over the world literally talk talk about that. In fact, the mural was a little, uh, maybe it was a little edgy angry, to use your word, because it was just a bunch of dead bodies floating on waves. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but, that's how, but that's how I was feeling um, yeah. back then. And, um, and I'm looking at this pandemic and I'm wondering, God, all these lives, over 100,000, just in this country alone, the ones that we've counted, because there are so many who have died that we haven't acknowledged this coronavirus related deaths, oh. that I want to create a project, at least here in my community, a Miami-based project where I would talk to leaders and have them um, tell me about this moment in time to capture this moment in history, sort of like that mural did. I wanted to capture the death yeah. in Africa due to AIDS then. And that's what that mural was about when people wrote their messages and put them on the mural. Well, here I'm using this vehicle to do that. So what I'm, I'm doing is I'm interviewing um, mostly local leaders, but I'm also um, going outside of Miami, interviewing people like yourself who have wisdom. Uh, I just interviewed the, the week or two ago uh, um, professor in a medical school in, in um, Malaysia to talk about how the pandemic impacted there. And I'll reach out to friends globally to bring in sort of a global perspective because it is a global pandemic. But mostly what I want to do is engage my community here in Miami to um, reflect upon what's happening, to capture how this pandemic impacted them and their communities. And I'm doing that by creating this platform where I um, have conversations that come on with having with you to hopefully uh, educate and inspire them. I'm creating art pieces. Oh, here, I, uh, every every uh, night I uh, keep a record of uh, those who have died in this diary that I have. So then, you know, I, I post these things on the diary, I mean, on the, on the thing, and I'll be creating an art piece, sort of like the Durban mural documenting that. Uh, so that, some videos, this, but the whole purpose of this is when when we engage the community and they see all this, then they can contribute their own voices. Like how did, you know, yeah. how did, you know, burying, I mean, uh, not being at the ICU when my mom died, how did that impact me? Because I, I don't want us to forget. And I'm just, I'm just so fearful, fear again, sorry, but I'm just so fearful that- uh, It wasn't fearful. Yeah, I'm so fearful. I mean, I was in, in a COVID hospital for five days. I'm when, sorry? You, you, when I broke, I broke my bone. Oh my God, sure, sure. And it, it was one of the most horrendous experiences of my entire life. So. Um, Tell me a little bit about that, if you care to. The well, I broke my trochanter, which is high up, you know, so you don't get a cast. You have to have an operation where they pin you. And um, I mean, the hospital, everybody, the staff was worn out. The, we were not, we were separated. So the COVID people were somewhere else, but um, we were actually in a ward. I'd set up a, a ward, uh, you know, with just a curtain between each bed. Oh my God. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and then you, they have to test you and all these things, but we operate, you know, and you can't talk to anybody. You don't have any friend. Nobody's with you. You can't visit. And the nurses are just, they're just, you can just see it on their faces. The first night I was there, in fact, they talked all night long about COVID and dying. I was just like, oh my God. I'm so sorry, Betsy, my God. <laughs> I'm gonna be operated on tomorrow morning. And they don't wanna like, you know, it's just like, there are a couple of people who were relaxed, but basically people look terrified. They, somebody came in and just some kind of makeshift plastic clothing. I saw I was with a bag lady off the streets to do something with my heart. I, I really felt like I was in an altered universe. And yeah. I, <laughs> I, I, all I could do was become really good and really kind. And I got home and I just collapsed like, um, and could begin, it took me a long time to even begin to feel how deep it was that I experienced there. 
And then again, you're at home by yourself, so none of the services that are normally provided are available. No home care, none of those. You know, fortunately, I have family, and I had a couple of friends who were willing, in spite of COVID, to come over. So it's, uh, wow. I also have to tell you that I finished a book called um, Living Water, no, A Memory of Living Water which is with the publisher, I'm just waiting to hear back. I mean, they might say they might reject it. It's a whole manuscript is done. Congratulations, Betsy. Yeah. And you did that now during this period? There... No, no, I did it in the last three years. Yeah, yeah. But... yeah. Oh, and sad. it was a huge thing. It's a big book. Um, and it has all the tools that I learned around community, even samples of workshops. And uh, oh, how exciting! I'd love to. I'd love to. Well, let me you know, know. You know uh, about that. And, you know, it has. It's a combination of me and then all these uh, things I learned. You know how I. You know, people. No one has, uh, other than Arlene Goldberg, I think, really understands that. When I meet with a group of artists, I don't tell them what to do, and I don't curate them. I open up a wide door for each artist to learn something, learn something about the situation and then decide what they personally want to do or collaborate. And they have to decide among themselves how to share whatever money is available. That is unheard of here. Yeah. It's unheard of. Everybody's like, we want you to curate and we want this money, we need that, you know. And so in China, I witnessed 25 artists figure out how to share $7,000. And, you know, when somebody wanted half the budget, they just very kindly said to him, no, come up with something else. We really want you to do something with us. But no, you can't do that. <laughs> and everyone lived on that. Me too. We all lived on $5 a day. Well, you know, that could be 10 or $20 a day, but it was, you know, very minimal. And I would have done it too. Um, and the creativity was just unleashed. Unleashed. <laughs> so I have a Chinese granddaughter. My son married a Chinese woman. She's here now. <laughs> yeah, you told me. You told me she was coming. Yeah. yeah, and she said to me, uh, they call me Ganny. She said, Ganny, the virus is unleashed. You better not go out. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so um, I do believe that human creativity and relationships are infinite. It's infinite. And every one of those children you've touched, they, they won't forget. They will not forget. And their parents will not forget. And you know, I know you talk to leaders and lawmakers in your community. I haven't gone that far. I always... <laughs> I, um, I'm... Um... <laughs> I am about slow activism. That's the practice, you know, that's why yeah. I do that. But I am also desperate because <laughs> I don't have time for these children to be adults because yeah. I kind of want them to get to adulthood. So I got to I gotta hit them at all angles. Wait. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the sense of urgency we have here. You know? Yeah, so, just a little tiny bit. <laughs> Betsy, it's been so wonderful uh, reconnecting um, with you. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thanks for Thanks for you. And and these words, I, I um, I'm gonna I'm gonna um, I'm teaching a social practice course uh, this fall. I'm gonna play this video in its entirety to them. What what an incredible um, gift that you're giving my students just by by sitting here. And it's gonna be on the on the website in a few days, but I'll I'll definitely play it in the in the fall. Thank you, Betsy. And hopefully well, your book will you. be. Let me know about your, let me know about your book as soon as, as well, we do. Okay. Well. Thank you. I love connecting with you. I can, it reminds me of everything, you know. It's really cool. So we can. Yeah, I remember having Korea and New York City with you. I, uh, uh, JC yeah. and I, after we were done, we went to the Church of the Transfiguration, saw uh, Varela. Remember the. Yeah. The, the, that um, Varela was a, a um, Cuban uh, priest who uh, worked with. Um, migrants in uh immigrants in um in new york city and he had a church there and he eventually sort of the leader of uh the independent movement that uh broke uh, cuba away from spain as uh, as a spanish colony so i remember i just remember the whole day that we had with you uh yeah. back then and of course i remember you being with us in miami and your work throughout the years so i just uh 
just so grateful that we had this moment here uh, digitally to connect. So uh, stay safe and healthy and continue inspiring all of us. Thank you. you too. And thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> right. Take care. Bye.